Uh, I'm gonna get started. Welcome everybody. Welcome um, you folks from your home or your office or wherever you may be right now um, to our fall webinar. Hopefully everyone's setting into their brand new fall routine, whatever it may be, um, and everyone as well. Um, today we have two major topics um, for our, our, our fall webinar. One is to talk about where we are with the CMDKP and some exciting new developments. And then Marie is gonna do a deep dive into the predicted vector gene module that we have in the portal that's a growing activity and will be really one of the um, sort of crown jewels of the portal going forward in the, in the coming months and years. So she's gonna to talk to you about what we have available there and then what's to come. And one of the things in that space that we'd really like to get is feedback on that because this is a combination of curated results, novel, un, in some cases unpublished, as Maria alluded to, bioinformatic predictors, which you know, haven't been completely validated. But our goal in the portal, you know, in our spirit of open access and making results available to people who could use them, is to make these results available. And as they become more mature, work with the people who originate the results and the community to sharpen and hone and make it more about knowledge delivery um, and delivering the best results possible. So that's really what this is about. You know, remember it's scientific software, so this is why it's fun. So today I'm gonna to kick off a little bit with, um, you know, sort of picking up on where we were in our July um, webinar, talk to you about the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal and where we are with that, and then I'll turn it over to Maria. Um, so when we talked to you in July, we had a beta version out that you could all play with. Well, now we have a production level knowledge portal for common metabolic diseases out. And you can go to it by two URLs, cmdkp.org or hugeamp.org. Both will go there. Um, they, one redirects and one lands directly there. But both of them work. Um, and this is open access and publicly available. We haven't had a live launch yet. We're going to time with some publicity you know, in partnership with the NIDDK and FNIH over this and our other collaborators once we want to go live. Because right now, the older portals are still active and still there. Um, but as you can imagine, we really like to turn over to this as our you know, major force going forward and our flagship portal for common metabolic diseases encompassing the four portals within. So I'm going to give you a little brief tour of things like that and what's going on there. Um, but moreover, you know, really what this is for us, just to just remind you, it just expands on our simple idea that making genetic and genomic data more broadly accessible and useful hopefully will help us treat um, disease and improve human health. And we've done this hopefully successfully for many years now for the type diabetes knowledge portal, as you all come to know. Um, and what we've simply done here is expanded this to common metabolic diseases, but taking into account um, building brand new backend architecture, which I've talked about in other meetings, um, and bringing together four communities um, who have, you know, um, just authoritative data they want to represent and content and methods they want to preserve and make available in their disease space but they want to use the power of the software platform and data platform we've, we've, we've built for types of diabetes. And since these diseases are so related, bringing them into one umbrella is extremely important and will hopefully make it more useful rather than just accessibility. But if you still want to peruse the cardiovascular disease knowledge portal, the cerebrovascular disease knowledge portal, or the sleep disease knowledge portal, they're all here with inside the common metabolic disease resource meaning that you can click to that specific disease area and see the specific content, data sets, and tools that are in that specific community. And you can also bounce right back out to the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal and see them all integrated together. What's really lovely about this is that our data footprint has increased threefold in the last two years. So this is two reasons. One, people are starting to catch on and wanting to share the results with publication, sometimes ahead of publication, we have more communities involved who are contributing data and methods to the portal and results. So in 2018, in August of 2018, we only had 47 data sets and 73 traits. Last year at this time, we had 81 data sets and 173 tra uh, traits. Today, we have 154 data sets across 313 traits. What you're also noticing with this, if you see that divergence, is we're getting more rich traits for the data sets we have which is really cool because it allows you to mine those data sets. We're also increasing our diversity in the data sets and the ancestries we're representing as we bring in these larger scale UK biobank cohorts and top med type results into the portal. It really will increase the diversity of the data sets and traits as we go forward. However, you know, with this, really what this portal has been, you know, for the past five years to me is a place for the representation and um, sharing of genetic results, right? P-values, all the results, the direction of effect across all these traits in these various diseases. 
But what you've noticed is because, you know, GWAS has identified mostly regions for us, we just have been given the genetics. We're really stuck with our still, still the same challenge, which is for so many of these loci, you know, we don't know what the gene or the variant or the regulatory effect is. So this forces us to shift our focus towards function with our community and with, um, you know, with our platform over the coming years to help guide the scientific software to produce the right, you know, results to allow investigators to help with this complex orchestration of research when, in trying to figure out what the variant is, what the regulatory effect is, and then what tissue, what gene, what pathway, and ideally what mechanism, right? So to do this, you require many different data types, not, that, not just the genetic data, which we've done a pretty reasonable job of representing, but many annotations and bioinformatic methods. So our goal initially is to, because many of these data sets have come to a place where they're mature enough and there is foundational data sets available, and publicly accessible in many places, just like we do with the genetics, we're gonna go for the genomics and the large scale um, functional resources and methods to catalog, integrate, and visualize these results together. So to do that, you know, we have a total new set of gaps to address with this opportunity. We need to know what are the data types? How mature are they? What validation is needed? Many times they still need to be generated. What information must be retained and captured and thereby represented? And then, you know, because you have genomic and genetic annotations, oftentimes they need to be, methods need to be run across them. These large scale methods need to be run, but how are they validated? Who, who decides? And then how are the results then represented? Because you have sort of matrix results of relationships between different outputs, you have to figure out how to represent these in a way that makes sense. That's really gonna be the work of the coming years. We're very lucky that to grow and sustain the types of diabetes knowledge portal, um, we have a next phase of type 2 diabetes um, and type 2 diabetes. So we're at the end of our first you know, five years of funding, and we were very lucky that the NIDK offered the, the Broad Institute an opportunity to apply for a limited competition award to extend the knowledge portal and continue to grow it for the next five years. We're very lucky that we were awarded that just in August, so it just kicked off for the next five years. So the next iteration of the AMP TGD knowledge portal um, is going to be headed by Jason um, as you all know, Mike Benke and myself with Jose, Kyle, and Thomas, as they've done before, working with us to build the portal as they've done before at EDI and UCSD. So that'll be the team for the Knowledge Portal, along with the wonderful team of engineers and computational biologists at all these institutes have been building the portal and aggregating the data for several years. Moreover, NIDD's commitment to understanding effector genes for type of diabetes and its complications is added to by their commitment to fund two other large projects. So these, these groups will be joining us in the consortium as we go forward um, to really focus on functional genomics. And there's two groups. Um, one brings together folks from UNC, Bro, Michigan, and Stanford, many of you who you know in the type of diabetes field, headed by Karen Mulkey and Jose and Anna Gloin, all together working together in one functional genomics project. And another one from a group all together at UPenn who will bring together a whole new set of techniques and tools that complement the other award and really help us nail down functional genomics for type diabetes and its complications. So this will be an exciting activity as we span forward for type diabetes and its complications in the coming five years. So we're looking forward to that. In addition to growing and sustaining, you know, as we move towards common metabolic diseases, really our flagship or crown jewel of the, the portal that we represent, other communities still want to expand their specific community portals. The cerebrovascular community, we're going to be working with them, hopefully to put in a proposal in January to bring in imaging data into the portal and represent that with genomic annotations and genetic data. The CBD community still actively works with us to bring together their CAD gene predictions data. We're adding a, a, a knowledge portal for type 1 diabetes, as you all know, because NIDK believes we really want to make sure all diabetes is represented on the knowledge portal and more. So our, really, our goal here is in the common metabolic disease space to grow and sustain this portal in many, many areas. So with that, a little bit about what you're seeing in the portal. Again, here's the entry points. You can find your disease-specific portals here. I wanted to show you a couple of things that you may not have noticed that weren't available when we talked last time. They're very simple, but they're, to me, very important because when we have had many data sets in the portal, you often go to your data set or the data, data set that you know the best, and you look at the, you know, the, the Manhattan plot for that and the top results. But what you're now going to see in the portal, because we have, on many cases, so many data sets for a given trait, everything is going to be more summarized and distilled for you, such that you're gonna see one bottom line set of results for all of diabetes or all of CAD. Whereas before you would see it all sort of, it would, it would be distilled, but it would be very much lists into tables. We're gonna to start to bring those, that information together, to try and summarize it, such that we can add the genomic annotations and other visualizations to layer that on. 
So I'm just gonna pop out for a second and show you that for one second, just so you can get a sense of the differences. So many of you are familiar with the cerebral vascular disease portal, for example, right? So by that, this portal today, you go here and you type in your, your favorite phenotype. If you go to coronary artery disease, right, you're gonna see the Manhattan plot, which if you've all been there recently, it's a little slow. It only has one data set for CAD, and you don't see the full Manhattan plot. But you do see the results, it's very useful, it's all good. But now what can you do? Well, watch this. So if you go to the common metabolic disease knowledge portal, right? You type in your favorite phenotype, click on phenotype, you go to coronary artery disease. Comes up for you. I've preloaded it because that's great, right? <laughs> it's like a cooking show. You'll see not only the Manhattan plot, but the QQ plot. And this is not just the QQ plot and Manhattan plot for that one, one data set. It's all the data sets combined with the bottom of line analysis that we've run that brings together the best of metal from our collaborators at Michigan and does sample aware meta-analysis and allows you to get the top results for all the data sets, which are listed here. But we have coronary artery, artery disease as a phenotype in the portal. So you can get the top results for everything together. But if you're really interested in the specific data set, which many of you are, you can go to that data set now and see just the results for that. And so this has now kind of replaced, you know, that data page that we've got, we've added to that data page, not only the, all the information that you've had about where the data set comes from, the provenance, publications, downloads, but your own custom QQ plot and Manhattan plot for just that phenotype and just that, that um, data set. And then you can search and see what other phenotypes we have available on that data set here, and you can quickly swap to that. That's sort of a new way of looking at, you know, the complete combined results for a given phenotype, but then allowing you to drill down into a given sample um, and data set if you want to. So that was not on the portal last time. So before I go to Maria, just a couple more notes. You know, as I mentioned before, we have a type 1 diabetes portal. Again, it has the exact same scan that you've been seeing and navigating through for um, the common metabolic disease, and that's available today, and active data sets are being added to that, and that's I mean, a very new experience for us because it's a whole, whole new set of collaborators, a whole new set of phenotypes and ways of representing data there. And then, let me get there. So what's not on the portal right now? There's two things that you may be used to seeing um, in the old framework. One is the variant finder, which allows you to like select, you know, your favorite data set and a set of filters based on phenotypes and p-value thresholds. That's not there yet. That's coming online in October. Also custom aggregation tests. So if you're used to using our burden, um, our gate tool, as many of you know that, that's not currently on the new CMDKP. We're rebuilding that and really adding some really exciting features in our next release that as we start to move towards things like being able to do non-coding aggregation tests with data sets like TopMed. So we had to build that one better before we released it. So roll out. The production grade portal is available to you today, um, but all other portals are still available. We want to phase out the old ones. So we're going to do a press release and formal launch in the coming weeks in collaboration with our, um, our funding partners and our communities. And then we eventually phase out the old portals sometime in the end of September, early October, depending on timing. But throughout all this time, we'll be doing training and feedback because we want you to be able to see the new site, tell us what you like about it, what you don't like, what you want to see. And then also make sure you can always refer back to the older site to make sure that, you know, if you remembered how you looked up something in an old site, you want to see it in the We'll also be transitioning our other publicly available portals over to this, including the MSKKP to the new York UI in October, such that everything will look the same if you go to any of the human genetics knowledge portal, um, um, port public portals. And this is where you can find them all. Um, this is our open access landing page for all publicly available portals. As you can see, they're all here. That's just another place you can find everything. And that's a new styling of it. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the musculoskeletal knowledge report, which we've talked about before in this setting, um, we're probably going to devote our November um, webinar to this portal because this portal has recently you know, been released in, in late spring. It has over 3,000 users and we're actively adding data and working with other communities to sustain this and fund this for the future. This is really exciting because this community cares a lot about um, genomic annotations and other data types particularly thinking about you know animal models and how might we represent that in the portal so it's really adding forcing us to think about a different set of questions all of which are relevant for our other portals which is great specifically we're going to work with them to add expression data and the visualizations to the portal and this will come online for all the portals as well so this is what really uh, an example of where another community has a personal interest in something but it's it's benefiting all the communities which is really the goal for this activity because you know it really spans common common diseases in general 
And as you can see, we're doing the exact same thing with lung disease. Hopefully we're going to launch this. We hope for August, we might wait for a little bit longer, as you can see, um, we're, but this brings together COPD, asthma, and interstitial lung disease. And this will be another portal that will be you know, powered by the same platform and available to the public. So um, joining, joining us future, again, our webinars are coming up in November at the same time. Um, noon every time and if you want any resources and learn anything about the portal again we've been adding to this as we convert over to the new UI we have to make new videos <laughs> which is fun but also requires us to do a lot of you know uh, filling in of the, the current videos which have the old um, framework so those videos is one available now all of our web webinars are available there and there's also going to be tutorials and extensive documentation about all the methods so with that, I'll thank the team. You know, they make this, this possible for us to talk about, which is, is, is totally true. Um, they're wonderful. And hopefully some of them are here to, to hear, hear about us talk about it. And again, the expanded team um, for the Alex Ellery Dimensions Partnership and, and beyond that, the folks that we get to work with. So with that, I'll turn it over to Maria. And if there's, unless there's burning questions, well, Maria's setting up. Any questions? I don't see any yet. All right, very good. Okay, so as Noel mentioned, a central challenge in complex disease research is going from variant to mechanism. Um, and I just wanted to start with a beautiful example of how this was done uh, by Melina Klausnitzer and colleagues. Um, so there are many variants within the FTO gene that are very significantly associated with BMI and with diabetes. And um, she and her colleagues first um, identified which gene these variants were affecting. It turns out not to be FTO, even though they're in FTO. It turns out to be um, the IRX3 gene and another one that's even farther away. It's not on the, this map, IRX5. Um, and so they, they um, identified these affected genes by um, using a bunch of different data types and techniques that I won't go into in detail. Um, but once they were pretty sure which were the effector genes, they could do then a, a lot of lab work in different models. Um, and they actually did work out, oops, sorry. I, uh, sorry. Um, so they actually worked out the mechanism in detail. And it's, it's very cool that the, the causal variant in the FTO gene actually um, disrupts a binding site for a transcriptional repressor. Um, when that repressor can't bind, the expression of IRX3 and IRX5 goes up. It disrupts the balance of white versus beige um, adipocytes, and it increases lipid storage and adiposity, BMI. Um, so this is the kind of um, knowledge that we all want to get from genetic associations. And what we'd like to do in the portal um, with these effector gene lists is to help um, investigators make this first step from variant to likely effector genes. Because if you're going to put all of this um, lab work in, in, you want to be pretty sure that you're working on the right gene. Um, so some of our long-term goals for these are, um, we want to provide the very best predictions to guide experimental work, obviously. And there's kind of a two-pronged approach. Um, first of all, we want to work with disease specific experts, disease communities, um, to get their expert curated predictions. Um, you know, they, they know um, the different data sources, all the studies that have been done, and they can, the experts can really put together um, very high confidence lists. Um, but of course, that's a very labor intensive activity and it, it can be done for the major diseases, but not for everything, not for every trait, um, or some disease communities may not have enough, you know, momentum to, to get that done. So um, a lot of people are also working on bioinformatic methods that, that can be run for all traits and um, use commonly available sources of data. And so those are going to be really useful as well. So we want to include results from those um, for, and for all traits that we can get them for. The first step will just be to include the lists and the underlying evidence in the portals. But then um, eventually we would like to actually take in some of these methods and implement them, implement them in-house so that we can just keep rerunning them as new data are available and, and get updated predictions. So right now we have two of these um, results for two of these methods in the portal and I wanna show them to you um, briefly. And then I'd like to get your feedback about how you would like to see these predictions. Um, so first of all, we have an expert curated list that we're calling curated T2D effector gene predictions. And this is from Anuba Mahajan and Mark McCarthy. This has actually been in the portal for a little over a year now, but we have a new interface for seeing it in the CMDKP. So I'll show you that in a minute. 
Um, but basically, they looked at three different types of evidence that a gene might be an effector gene. They looked at genetic evidence. So they looked whether there were coding variants in that gene that, were, that had a high posterior probability um, in credible sets from a very large uh, T2D GWAS. They also looked whether there were coding variants that had a high posterior probability in credible sets from an exome chip analysis. They considered gene level T2D association scores in um, the largest exome sequence analysis for type 2 diabetes, which was done um, here at the Broad, led by Jason Flanick. Um, they also looked in um, the database um, OMIM, Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, to, to see if a gene um, could mutate to confer um, diabetes or a related glycemic phenotype um, in a monogenic way. And then finally, because they're experts and they know the field, um, they considered other sort of one-off studies um, that might have been on a small population or might have been on an individual gene, but they, they knew about these studies and uh, so they gathered those that provided genetic evidence. Um, so they all consider, also considered regulatory evidence. They looked at whether um, cis-EQTLs affected expression of a gene in pancreatic islets, um, also in fat, muscle, or liver. Um, they looked at chromatin conformation to see if a T2D associated variant might contact the gene. Um, they looked to see if the variants affected chromatin accessibility. And then they looked at a, a study where um, that looked at glucose regulation of gene expression in a set of candidate genes and, and uh, looked to see whether expression of a gene is regulated by glucose. Finally, they looked at perturbation, so mutant phenotype evidence. And they looked at one study that, again, looked at a, a large set of candidate genes, silenced them in a beta cell line, and saw whether that silencing conferred a T2D-related phenotype. They also considered whether mutation of the homolog in a whole variety of model organisms might confer, confer a T2D-related phenotype. And again, they drew on their expert knowledge to, um, to include evidence from other individual studies. Um, so, okay, as I, now I'm going to just take you to a live demo. Um, as I said, that this, there is an interface in the classic T2D portal, but I'm going to show you um, the new interface in the CMDK, CMDKP. So here is the CMDKP. Um, under tools, we have predicted effector genes. So this is a landing page for all of the predictions. Um, and I'll show you that one in a minute. So um, here, is the section for the Mahajan McCarthy predictions. So um, this looks a little different from the, the previous interface, but it, it contains the same information. Um, so to see that the information on an individual gene, well, first of all, the gene names are obviously lo uh, linked to their gene pages in the portal, but you just click the evidence button to see, um, to expand a section and see the evidence for a gene. So here, for example, under the gold header is the, the genetic evidence. Under the green header, the, the regulatory evidence is, is uh, listed. And um, under the blue header, the model organism, or the, sorry, the mutant phenotype evidence. Um, and I forgot to mention that on that landing page that we just came from, there um, are links to um, complete documentation. Um, you can also filter this interface um, many different ways. If you're interested in just one gene, you can, um, you can filter to see just that gene. Um, you can also filter to look at the different um, categories. You can add a bunch of different filters um, and you can just add them and, and remove them as you like to, to explore um, all, of these, all of these predictions and the evidence behind them. Um, I actually just realized that I didn't really completely describe um, the method here. After describing those three types of evidence, um, what Anuba and Mark did was to um, make um, a scoring system for all of those types of evidence, which is all documented in our downloadable, downloadable documentation. And then they de developed an heuristic to combine the scores into the overall classifications. And on this page, you can see um, a graphical representation of how um, the scores in the three categories were combined to make these overall classifications of causal, strong, and so forth. All right, so that is um, the curated T2D prediction interface. And 
now I'm going to talk about a new interface um, that has just been added and um, it's the interface itself is still um, somewhat in development and that it, it needs um, a little clarification and documentation, but I'm going to show it to you anyway and I'd love to get your feedback. So this is work from Vince Forgetta and colleagues in Brent Richards group. Um, they have a um, preprint which is available on BioArchive for papers submitted for publication. And um, these, these colored boxes here show their methods from their paper, I'm, but I'm not going to go through all the details here. I'm just going to try to um, pull out some high level um, information about their, their overall strategy. Um, and um, Vince told me he might be on this call. So Vince, if you're here, please jump in if I say anything egregiously wrong. It's a really complicated method. Um, but as I understand it, um, they started out by first identifying some traits for which there were really large GWAS data sets. So they could do fine mapping and identify independent loci associated with those traits. And then for each trait, they came up with a set of positive control genes. And they looked for either genes that could mutate in a monogenic way to influence the trait or disease, and also genes that were known drug targets that could influence that trait or disease. And they looked at um, a bunch of different ways to map loci to genes um, for their model and, and experimented with them. And eventually they settled on three um, criteria that, that um, gave them good results. And so these three criteria are um, first, whether the variant alters a gene, a coding sequence or a transcript. Um, secondly, the distance between a gene and a variant. Um, and thirdly, whether the variant was located in or near a DNA hypersensitive site, which um, uh, indicates chromatin accessibility um, in a tissue relevant to the disease or trait. So gathering information on all these criteria for the, the variants, um, they built a model that would predict the EI or effector index. Um, before I go to the results, I just wanted to show um, one example, um, kind of a, um, a validation of the method. Um, so one of the phenotypes they looked at was estimated bone mineral density. And if you look at the results in the portal, the, the interface I'll show you in a second, the second highest ranked gene is LMX1B. Um, and this, I don't think this gene is, you know, really a, a, a top hit as far as um, genetic associations go. Um, uh, but if, if you Google, uh, sorry, if you do a PubMed search for it, it is, um, there's a lot of literature about its uh, involvement. It's it encodes a transcription factor. Um, it, it does seem to have a role in bone development. So this uh, is a really interesting kind of validation of the, the, um, the method, I think. And I want to show you the interface itself. Um, okay, let's go back to the landing page. And then this section um, deals with the effector index predictions. And as, um, it, it has a little summary and, and a link to the preprint. So these are the traits that they considered. Um, for some of the traits, there are long lists of predictions. So to uh, make the loading faster, we've given you an option to just load the top 100 or the full list for each trait. Let's look at estimated bone mineral density since we were just talking about that. Um, Okay, so again, this can be filtered by gene name and also by a probability threshold, if you like. Um, let's look at LMX1B that we were just talking about. So um, if you click on the features, you open up a window that has um, a ton of information. This is all of the underlying data um, about those um, independent, um, the SNPs from the independent loci that um, that went into um, the gene the overall gene probability score so i'm not going to go over all these columns right now but there is information about um, the variants themselves such as their positions and, and minor allele frequency and so forth um, there's also their their impact as um, as judged by the SNPF um, algorithm which um, considers the impact of, of a variant on a coding sequence and all of the other um, criteria that we talked about, the, the distance between the, the SNP and a um, DNA hypersensitive site and so forth, and the distance from genes. Those, all of those things are um, listed in this table. And as I said, we're going to work on more informative headers for these columns and more documentation to explain them. Um, and then under the gene, um, the, the green header is information pertaining to the gene, not just the SNPs. And so there's its probability, its uh, effector index score, 
um, the number of genes that were that were in this locus, um, the average of the SNP effects in this area, and so forth. Um, again, a lot of information, um, and some of this information is summarized graphically here. If you click on the gene feature summary button, you can see where this gene falls among other genes um, considered for this trait. Um, so, for example, here LMX1B has a higher effector index relative to of the other genes and so forth. Um, all of the criteria that went into the prediction, such as the impact, the DNA is hypersensitive and the, and the distance, they're all plotted here. So you can see where the gene fell for each of those criteria within the group. Um, okay, and yeah, you can also open multiple rows at a time. And I forgot to say, you can do that for the other effector gene list too, in case you want to compare across genes. All right, so that's the state where that is now. Um, and so I would also love to get your, um, oh, first before I ask you for your feedback, um, we're adding more of these prediction methods. And so coming um, pretty soon is not another um, algorithm for predicting T2D um, effector genes from Tim Majerian and Elisa Manning. And um, this one, uses different inputs from the effector index method that I just showed you. So it's going to be really interesting to compare the results from those two techniques. Um, we're also talking uh, with Krishna Aragam and Adam Butterworth from Cardiogram to, um, they're working on a method, um, uh, predictions of, an, of um, coronary artery disease um, effectors by using the POPs and FGWAS methods. Um, we hope to incorporate their list and also we're talking to several other investigators who have methods like this in development. Okay, now um, how, how I might you as users of the portal want to see these? Um, right now, the only way you can get to these predictions is through that landing page that lists the effector genes. So I'm going to go through a few ideas about where in the portal you might want to see these. Um, and it, it kind of goes without saying that um, like the other results in the portal, it would be nice to be able to access these results program, programmatically using APIs, as well as just looking on individual web pages for them. Okay, so if you're interested in a disease or a trait, um, I think you would definitely want to see a list of the genes that are the predicted effectors for that. Um, so we have a phenotype page. Um, as Noel showed you, um, that where you can see the associations, the meta-analyzed associations across the genome for that phenotype, um, the top so te, uh, ugh, excuse me, the top 1,000 associations and other other data about associations for that phenotype and annotations for that phenotype. So this would be a good place to summarize the effector index predictions. And I think at, at, on this type of page, you would want to have just the really high-level summary, like the the um, the prediction um, from the uh, Mahajan McCarthy method of just whether it's causal or strong or, or whatever. Um, and then um, a list for, say, for effector index, um, just given, giving the probability. And then you'd want to, of course, link to complete evidence for, for that phenotype. So that's one use case. Um, another use case would be if you're interested in a particular gene, of course, you would want to know whether it's predicted to be an effector for, for diseases or traits. So here, um, again, I think we could just have a table um, listing the, the methods for th that are predicting that this gene um, is an effector for a certain phenotype. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, show the high level, uh, the top level predictions and link to the, the more details. Um, third, if you're looking at a region, you would probably want to know whether across a region um, there are genes that are effectors for, for a particular trait. So um, here's our region page. And um, as, as we've talked about, the region page is set for a particular phenotype and that determines, um, for example, the phenotype that's shown in the locus zoom plot and so forth. Um, so there's a little graphic showing the genes overlapping the region. So I think here, one, one way to do this, there are many ways to do it. Um, you could, if a gene in the region is, an, is a predicted effector for the phenotype that the page is set for, then you could color it differently, for example, and hover over it to show that summary information about its, um, its predictions. 
And um, finally, you want to know what we have, you know, what methods, what phenotypes, and, and that we already have on this landing page that I've shown you. Um, obviously, as we get more methods, we're going to have to organize this better so it's easier to see at a glance what, what methods, what phenotypes we have. And one addition that I think would be really nice, depending on whether the authors um, agree to this, of course, is if we offered the ability to download everything, all the under the predictions and the underlying data for a phenotype and a method. So we'll be talking to people about that. I think that is all I have. Yeah. So um, I think we could open it up to questions. Unless, Noelle, you want to jump in with... Um, uh, yeah, just one sort of closing comment. That was great, Maria. Um, I, I also think that one of the things that we're, 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 we're still figuring out about how to represent is, you know, there are methods have different, you know, um, what's the word, maturity and also the, you know, the way, as Maria explained, some of them are bioinformatic predictors, some of them are curated, um, and some of them will be a combination thereof, somewhere in the middle, right? Um, one of the things that we're thinking about is how do you represent the whole thing together, right? How do you say, like, three of these methods predict this all to be the same or two one is for one is against i think that is our sort of our our longer term plan which is allowing you to see all of them and make your own inferences and decisions particularly now um, but then beyond that you know how do we help lead the scientists toward you know what methods we believe are like coalescing around sort of the answer and i think that's going to come over the coming years but i think what we're looking to you all in the community is you know how do we how do we bring you along for that such that we do it in right stages and that we are representing the, particularly the methods that people are doing, you know, accurately and also with the right caveats and context. Um, it's been great working with Brent and, and Vince because they've been working with us, like they have their method and we've been thinking about the context of others. And we have a small working group around this um, with all the people that have their, their bioinformatic methods and the curated methods to talk about how we're going to pull this together. So you'll be hearing from that, you know, we're going to work with that group very closely because they're both the generators and also sometimes the experts in, you know, the particular trait. So they know what evidence has, has said. So we're using that, you know, that as our foundation as well. And that group will start to help us, you know, help hone what that, what, what that should look like. Moreover, we're also looking for users for that um, because, each disease community may go about this differently. And Maria also did mention that, um, you know, when we work with Joel Hirschhorn in the obesity community, they reached out to us because they're doing the exact same thing for obesity and anthropometric traits. They have a very large new you know, meta-analysis that they want represented. And they also have a set of um, annotations relevant um, to obesity and anthropometric traits. And they also have a host of methods that we already have run. You know, we've encoded in our pipeline so we could run it across their data. Out, which would be novel for them, but moreover, they have specific methods they want to run. So we want to work with them to implement that and then represent those results. So that's really an exciting path, hopefully, for obesity and anthropometric traits that we'll be also pursuing for the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal. So lots to do, um, but we're curious your feedback and questions, if any. Allie, can they unmute themselves? Nope. Um, you'll just have to raise your hand in the Zoom meeting, and we can unmute you if you want to talk. How do you do that? I don't even know how to do that. There. Oh, James. I have a different. Oh, hey, James. How are you? Let's see. Sorry, Ali. How can we unmute James? How do we unmute James? <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> Hello. Okay. There you are. <laughs> All right. Hello. Um, I just wanted to flag to the community that um, in addition to the two UM1 grants from Broad and from Penn, um, our group who studies genetics, not functional, um, have um, funding now to, to join the effort. So we got yes, our... That's right. We got our... I proud to say four competing continuation um, of our R01 that we've been doing now. So we'll support years 14 through 18 or 19. I'm not sure. So um, uh, got a 10th percentile. So I just want to flag that too, because we're very proud of ourselves. <laughs> and so in any case, it'll be funded and we have agreed to convert it from an R back to a U uh, mechanism and we'll be joining that effort so that's that's point one is that we will be having the top med that you mentioned you know as seamlessly integrated with the new effort as possible 
And what's important about that is it provides all the data for the non-coding space that's missing from everything you just talked about. I mean, I think it's brilliant what you've got, but it's the coding space. And, you know, and I think we all agree that there's, that's the one that has to be interrogated intensively to find, you know, the really ideally impactful variants. However, you know, top has got a lot of data. And so I think one of the things that I'm sitting here listening is um, being glad that Elisa, who is the sort of um, the, the person at the helm, I'm the ballast the, of, the, of the new effort, is um, in, involved already in what you're doing. Because I, what I think we were, are going to want to do as we organize ourselves to um, take on the massive top med um, covariance matrices specifically, you know, is already be talking and thinking about how are we going to do this? You know, it's really daunting to yeah. be able to do in the non-coding space what you guys are doing now in the coding space because okay. of just the size of the data and the inability to host, you know, a lot of, a lot of it just can't be hosted as private, at least currently. So public, you know, so um, yeah, that's what I wanted to flag is that um, all is good on yeah. the funding, on the funding front to make, to make top med happen for you guys. Not only do we have, um, this is my final point, not only do we have um, funding for a UM1 grant to join T2D AMP version two, I guess we could call it. We also yep. got an R01 from um, NHLBI to look at cardiovascular disease in, in diabetes. So the inter, you know, interrelationship with those. That's funded and underway right now. And so you know, already I'm thinking, huh, we better be like kind of orienting that as well towards towards portal um, analysis and stuff. So I think the sooner we start talking with you guys about the covariance matrices, the better. Uh, because that, you know, for the other folks on the phone, that's the, been the hurdle of moving, yeah. of moving whole genome sequence non-coding data into the portal is that if you want to do burden tests with a bunch of variants, you need covariance between mm -hmm. The, ver the, va the, the, the variant, the variant right. with the T. And so um, <laughs> it's, and it's just, it's, un it's, 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 first of all, they're estimated on the fly using current methods. So they're like clouds in the sky. They're a thing that aren't there. Right. And so we have to solve that problem and uh, we've got a lot of work to do. And so I'm really, really, really psyched that this is happening and that we're going to be, you know, be able to participate. So, integrate top meds to as seamlessly as possible with with the portal so th thanks noel and, and maria no james i'm really glad you mentioned that actually because that's that's actually exactly what we're hoping and, and and is exactly the right direction and um you know i'm, I'm so glad that you guys are on board frankly uh, because you have the expertise and bringing the data I mean, you're right that challenge has been the um breadth of that data um but we're starting to work on it actually we have work going on with our, our colleagues at michigan to just start with the the bringing the top mid covariance matrices for the exomes right. in to allow us to run those aggregation tests on the fly in the portal. And that's coming right. in October. Right. Next, right on its heels is to represent the whole genome. And that's sort of, well, heels nice. <laughs> you make it easy. Well, that's um, excellent. Not, yeah, so that's- Excellent, that's what we're excellent, yeah. excellent, excellent. And then we've got Elisa on the other side in terms of like, you know, thinking of how you bring all this information together and yeah. doing the predictors. So, we were uh, hoping we can do Well, that. and then the other thing that's coming, maybe I do have a fourth point, I, is o other omics. So we're yep. going to have from Top Med as part of our aims, and we would like to put the stuff in the portal to our associations with proteomics. With I, well, let's see, let's start, you know, transcriptomics, methylomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics in tens mm -hmm. of thousands of people with genomics. And so you can imagine pages on the portal that show associations with exactly. pro protein levels, you know, or mm -hmm. blood expression levels, that kind of thing. And then people are, you know, in the AMP space, I don't know how you're going to integrate the expression. I guess, you know, does, does DGA, is that going to be a freestanding separate thing? Where it, do you, do you know any idea, have any idea about that? Where the, Both. So it'll be a freestanding entity and Kyle will continue. Kyle is a, is a co-I on the next iteration of AMP and DGA. We hope to expand to the tissues and the cell types and the relevant data types to house all those and represent them as well. But then moreover, 
send those to the portal such that they can be integrated with the genetic data and then represented in some of the visualizations that we started to build and hope to build out. So yes, he is, he is our place for that. Thank well, because I think, yeah, excellent. Because you need a, still need a socket for that stuff. For instance, yeah. Elisa, Rob, Sladek, and I are working on a project that eventually will, you know, want to share the data. And it's, you know, plat, t um, blood and mus muscle tissue expression before and after, dur you know, dur before and during a steady state clamp. And, you know, so data like that would be great to put in there so that then you can link it through to the other genomic exactly. association. So you can imagine about, and you know, really this is N dimensional data, right? I mean, there's just so many layers to it. And you guys are doing a really nice job of representing it and, and I'll stop there. Oh, thanks. Thanks, James, appreciate it. I see another hand up. Um, who else is there? That's for me, Noel. It's hey, nice. Laura, how Hi. are you? Hi, good. So I'm really interested to see the um, effector gene page and what I see on it is a really small number of genes. Um, like I went to go look for one of my favorites at the moment and didn't see it on the page. And so I wondered, um, I think that means that it didn't meet any of the criteria, you know, to, to, to get in any of those, those categories. But there's a, there's a piece of me that, that I'm wondering whether there's a way to see what the evidence was in those different categories for genes actually that aren't on the list, because I think that's almost as useful to understand why it isn't there for somebody yeah. who's going to pursue it and might have to justify it by this page or might not, you know, depending. Totally awesome question and exactly right, because you want to know, I don't want, you want to be able to rule out a gene, right? Which is effectively what you're saying. So let's start with that for the, so it um, depends on which list you're looking at. So the, for the curated Mahajan list, I don't think all the genes are up there because that's a heuristic, I believe. And I could be wrong about that. But for Brent and, Brent and Vince's method, I think you can get to the full list, but I don't know if all genes are in there. Maybe Brent, are you still on it? Vince, ah, cool. Let's allow you to talk. Can we allow you to talk, Vince? Can you speak to, should there be results for every gene? But moreover, one actually one thing, we are implementing Brent and Vince's method in the portal to run across all data sets and traits. And that would then, I believe, give results for all genes if they're not already available. But Vince, I'll hand it over to you. Sure. Uh, also, thanks. That's actually a very good question. Brings up a very good point. Uh, so yes, so currently the, um, the effector index, the way it's designed, is it targets only genes that are near a gene with loss focus because the aim of the algorithm is to answer a very specific question is given a GWAS locus, what is the causal gene at this locus? Um, and it's not just uh, asking, also the more interesting question is what are the causal genes in general for this trait? Um, and so in that regard, uh, the, the list of genes for which we have um, the effector index probabilities for are gonna be within about a megabase of a, of a lead SNP for a GWAS locus. Um, however, it might be interesting to put into the interface, basically, um, the list of loci uh, either as a table or something so people can see the genes that, that were considered by the algorithm and the genes that, uh, that were not, basically, as a consequence of that. I think that would be really useful, and I think then I'm fine if it's within a megabase. I mean, most of it we, we think is that way. Um, but being able to see it for everything and, and to know kind of what data set, to have a way, maybe this is asking more than it can do, but for any given category, let's say EQTLs, to know what data set you're using to say, oh, there's no you know, EQTL or no co-localization, right, or whatever you're doing, at that point, so yeah. I could say, oh, in my data set, I do see this, so that's why it didn't get in here. So Laura, I can, I can speak to that. So in that complete documentation that we have for the um, Mahajan uh, McCarthy effector predictions, that does list every reference that they, they looked at. So you can look at those and, and say, oh yeah, my EQTL is not in that paper, that's why my gene isn't, isn't on the list, for example. Brent, Vince, did you want to say anything else? Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, same thing. Oh, sorry, sorry I'll, I'll, I'll just answer quickly, thank you. Uh, 
so we can also provide that information as well. Uh, that, that's an excellent idea. Uh, it's part of the supplementary uh, tables in the bioarchive preprint, uh, basically listing all the QPL data sets that were used by TRAIC, which were, uh, in, in this case, one or more, depending on, uh, on, um, on the method used to select the QPL data sets. But they're all basically from GTEx, uh, but a subset of, of the relevant tissues from GTEx. But Laura, what what the um, what the portal does, and which you, which you can download, is actually all of the different types of evidence that um, support or do not support um, an association of a gene at a GWAS locus and its probability of being causal. Uh, it also the portal. One of the nice things about the portal is that it shows you graphically where that gene stands insofar as the um, compared to other genes for evidence from that, from that source of evidence. So it shows like a distribution of, um, of evidence from, a, a different, from different uh, data sources such as DHS sites, et cetera. And it shows you graphically where that gene stands on that uh, distribution of evidence supporting um, for that different feature. That's features that will be coming in the portal. No, I think it's already there. there. Yeah, it's already there. Um, it, as um, as Maria has been careful to state, as well as Noel, is that it's still a work in progress. We haven't, we're not really happy in its totality yet, but it's pretty close, and that 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 is there. And I guess one of the things that I'm having a little bit of trouble navigating in this is to know. So I see the tools right at the start, that drop down menu. Um, but knowing what, what I need to do, what the effector genes, what a tissue focus means, what, what that's going to give me, right? When I do that, what a variant finder means. And maybe there are, maybe there are things defining it, but is somebody coming to it without having any knowledge of what these things do? It's, it's hard to know where I need to go to find what I want. And I guess my ignorance is good in this place because maybe I represent a new rather than a seasoned user. That's really good feedback, Laura, actually. It's, I mean, it is, it's dense to find it, I agree. Yeah, so well, the tools you mentioned, we've made videos about most of those. You were looking at the, the classic T2D portal, I can tell from the, the menu items you mentioned. And so we, um, we do try to, have each tool page, you know, in, include a, a brief summary of what it is and what it does. But we're also, we have made videos for the, the older tools and we'll make new videos for the new iterations of those tools in the portal. But yeah, I, I, I agree. We need, we need to do a better job with documentation. I, I, and I think it's documentation right when you come into the, and, and maybe I just haven't read it um, well enough when I get to the home, right? But when I get to the home, I see, you know, you can put in a gene variant or region, right? And then there are these tools up here, right? It's, it's unobvious to me why I would want to go to tools. Maybe there's a new view of this that takes care of this, right? But, but it almost seems like you would want an orientation that's like a, the, the, the place where you put in the gene variant or region is like the quick start you know, just put it in and see what comes out, right? And then you could have something that says, this is your quick start. These are the more focused ways that if you already have a question, you can go do it. And just a couple sentences to orient somebody to all the different things that they could go in and do. Because um, I have no idea what tissue focus is. Right, and I don't want to have to click down through each one of these to figure out what I want to do. Mm -hmm. and there are only Fair enough. more tools, right? No, that's a good point, Laura. So as we, so in the new framework, which I'm showing on the screen now, I think what we're trying to do is point the user towards a workflow where they might want to say, like, if I'm going to start with a given region, I'm going to want to know what genes are in the region, what's the phenotype that's most associated. So we're still you're right, orienting straight from the genetics, right? But then you're right. If they don't want to know that information, they just want to, they have a specific question and they want to drill down to an analytical tool. In the older framework, you write, you go up to the toolbar and you have all the analytical modules, the separate one, the variant focus table, the pre predicted effector genes, the Manhattan plots and things like that. Now we're pulling a lot of things out of the tools table 
and putting them into a workflow page. And this is sort of like what you're seeing on the new framework, which is sort of walking you through a region. And right at the bottom of the page, you know, there is this, what is soon gonna be its own module, frankly, which is the exploration, right, of a given region. Um, this, for example, may not be intuitively like, oh, where would I find this, right? I, I see your point exactly. So that is an interesting tension that we're trying to work with. Normally what we probably do is put this as a tool up in the tool table because we want to just go into it because I want to explore a region or something like that. But right now in its current sort of state of development, we're treating this more as a workflow like you'd start with the genetics and then move towards exploration. But you're right, as these things get more mature and more about like, this would be more about exploration, we would probably want to make this more clear. Like if you want to answer this question, go here. So that's a really good thing to keep in mind as we make these more mature and, and better things for people to navigate. I like that. Thanks. Any other questions? These have been great. No? Awesome. Um, this indicates to me that this is a module that hopefully people get more excited about and use um, and give us feedback on. And so um, we'll, we'll look to talk to you all again and actually probably as a new method comes up for the next, next round of predictive effector genes, maybe focus out on, on this in another webinar as well, because this will allow us to have a little bit more maturity in the space. And also this particular module I'm showing right here will have a new, in, new installation actually coming in October, which I think will be really exciting for people to see. Um, it will involve some locus, some accoutrements, um, some new annotations, I'll ideally allow you to select your favorite tissue, which I love, um, and things like that that will come online. Also, we're getting more credible sets in, which will add to the amount of data here. So look forward to that. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? I think we're just at time. Look at that. So we did have one raised right. hand. Um, oh, yeah. Who do we miss? Zhe Wang? Oh, yeah. If you would like to. Do you want to ask a question? Nope. Oh, okay. Okay. Hey, you know, <laughs> if you need to. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining. This was really useful and great and good feedback and enjoy using the portal. And we'll see you in November for our next webinar um, Thursdays at noon. Take care, everyone. Vince, Brent, thank you. That was Thanks, awesome. Everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.